Hello everybody, I hope you're joining us tonight. It's really lovely to have you here. If you don't know who I am, my name's Joanne Hull. I'm an animal communicator, animal advocate, and an author. And tonight we've got a very, very, very special guest on. In fact, my fingers are tingling with excitement. It doesn't happen very often. It's a really strange, buzzy feeling because this lady is amazing and I cannot wait to bring her on. Now, her name is Ren Hurst. You may have heard of her. I'm, I've got some notes here, so I'm going to read them. So do excuse me. Uh, she's a former professional horse trainer and producer and a hoof care specialist. She's a president and co-founder of the New World Sanctuary Foundation and also an author oops, of this fantastic book, Riding on the Power of Others, A Horsewoman's Path to Unconditional Love. If you haven't already got this book, I really suggest you go out and get it. It's available on Amazon. It is amazing and it might just change your life. So very excited to bring Ren on. So here we go. Ren, are you here? Hi. I'm here. Thank you, Marianne. Brilliant. Lovely, lovely to have you here tonight. And I, I hope the guys are watching. I hope I, we've got people in the room now. If you've got any questions, please, please ask them and we will see if we can ask Ren. Now, Ren, can you tell us a bit about your background before what you do now? So the sort of, um, you know, the, the traditional scene, like what, what, where did you grow up? How did you get into horses? and what the traditional sense was of horsemanship and how you, you lived with them. Well, my, my former life is about as clear opposite as you can get from my life today. I was born and raised in Texas, um, and I'm sure there's stereotypes around that that would probably fit who I was back then. I had a pretty um, tumultuous and traumatic childhood that led me to horses as a young girl. And I used horses and the training of horses and just that that lifestyle to, you know, um, not have to deal with a lot of the things I was going through. Uh, the horses made me feel better. So I was drawn to them and I got quite good at it. And so I began my horse journey pretty ignorant. I uh, didn't have a lot of um, familial history with horses. So I had to learn a lot on my own and through people I met along the way and started with the more traditional cowboy style type of training and riding horses and moved up through the natural horsemanship movement and then into the liberty and uh, the positive reinforcement movement. And then finally I joined um, Nefsarov Ot Akol and between that school and everything I was exploring experientially outside of horses, I, I experienced a pretty radical paradigm shift that led me to the work I do now. Fantastic. And so what was your wake up call? What actually happened? And um, can you explain what you actually do today? Um, it's, it's not easy to put in a nutshell what I do today, but what happened was the culmination of several events. I mean, for one, at that stage when this shift occurred, I had a solid 15 years of experience in the professional horse world. I had succeeded uh, quite well at buying, selling, training horses, being a professional hoof care practitioner. I had traveled um, to many places and learned from some of the best in the industry of the various modalities that I was practicing. And so I had a tremendous amount of experience. I had trained hundreds of horses. I had rehabbed uh, lots of cases of horses that should have or would have been euthanized for various behavior or hoof ailments. And so there was a tremendous amount of knowledge and background that was probably really necessary for why this shift occurred in me so, so radically. But when I started applying the principles of the NHE school with a stallion that had never been previously worked with, what was able, what was, what resulted from that relationship, it just flew directly in the face of everything I knew at that stage about what these animals were, what they were capable of, what our relationship to them was really about. And in a, a moment, just really raw vulnerability between me and the stallion, I just had the deep insight that 
not only had I not ever truly loved anyone unconditionally in action in my entire life, but humanity had not really understood what that was. And that became very apparent to me with this animal that I had loved, maybe the first being I've ever loved unconditionally within this captive setting that was a direct contradiction to the love I claimed to have for him. And so, you know, there's a lot of elements to that. I kind of go into it in more detail in, the, in my book, but um, there were so many things happening that just crashed my reality around me in, in a moment. And there was no turning back from that point. Mm. And it's, and it's almost, it's, sorry, it's almost like a heart connect, isn't it? It's like once you go there, you can't, you can't, it's almost like you can't not go there, if that makes sense. <laughs> oh, and my life would have been much easier to not go there with the amount of animals I had in my care at that time. So because things changed with that horse, everything had to change. And um, I left Texas. I sold everything I owned. I left my really successful career. I walked away from all of it to give the horses in my care a life of sanctuary while I got to the bottom of what this means and what is this domestication and how can domestication be congruent with love? And since we have all of these animals to take care of, how do we resolve that in our own lives? And what is the value of resolving that? Is there value in continuing to domesticate other beings and use them for our own purposes? Or is there value in finding a different relationship that unlocks limitless potential? And I think that most people in the animal world are without knowing, and I'm, I mean this without knowing, are sort of disconnected in some way. And we, we're sort of taught through the narrative of our parents, our teachers, our churches, uh, friends, relatives, etc., schools, how to connect and what that does, it seems to disconnect us. So we go the opposite way. Why do you think that is? Why do you, what, what's your take on that? Why do you think we're so disconnected? Even though we love animals, why are we so disconnected with them on that level? I believe that domestication is the root of our separation from one another, not just from animals, but from each other and all life around us. And that happened a long time ago. And so the new book I'm writing and the, and the basis of my new work is really like looking at that fundamental foundational separation because it takes separation in order to see someone as different enough from you to use them. And even though we, we claim to love the animals in our care, obviously we feel affection and admiration for them. But our day-to-day -day practices with them are anything but the unconditional love we preach in relationship to one another, even when it is driven by kindness and good intentions. And so I think we feed that disconnection through these habitual practices that are the result of our own domestication and our own conditioning. And it's very challenging to challenge these deeply held beliefs because it doesn't feel good. And we are a society that is driven by feeling good. When the actual solution comes from learning how to feel everything and becoming emotionally autonomous and mature and aware for what those feelings mean within our own bodies. Yeah, absolutely. And so bringing it back to today, how is your life different? I know you said it changed completely, but how is your life different with the animals today? than it was back then before you sort of had that wake up? It's extremely challenging, um, only because I have so many. Um, a sane person, honestly, would <laughs> never take on the responsibility of this many empowered, undomesticated, permanent, captive, dependent beings. That's just not reasonable uh, because this is, I have 29 animals in my care and that's not a reasonable amount of children to care for for one person. <laughs> and so my life looks like being in service to them to the very best of my ability. I am responsible for them. I am t I am being accountable for, for why they are in my care. I have no desire to add more to the equation or to keep moving in any sort of direction like that, but I have a significant amount of animals. So in one of the ways my life significantly looks different 
is instead of living in a 2000 square foot house and having a life that caters to, to my personal desires and needs, I took the little bit that I had and purchased a piece of land for them um, that is for them. And I live in 96 square feet of a rustic shack in the middle of nowhere and I have solar power. And I mean, basically what you can see in the camera is half of my house. And so that's a huge change. Everything has been simplified tremendously and traumatically to be responsible for these animals. And it only has to look that extreme for someone who was in an extreme situation. I mean, I went from the epitome of professional exploitation to the complete opposite end of no exploitation whatsoever. I don't even exploit my animals in sanctuary any longer, which is really common these days, um, especially as the vegan movement is rising to make these captive dependents available to people um, mm. for a lot of reasons. But part of sanctuary is ending the pursuit of someone. And so we provide unconditional safety and care to the animals here. And eventually I hope my new work turns into a new career that can support me a little bit <laughs> differently than this, but this is okay. And um, because of the healing work I've done through loving the animals this way, I can live like this without it um, resulting in a lot of suffering. Yeah, brilliant. It's fantastic. And and your story resonates so much with me because it's so similar to my life. <laughs> and if it'll make you feel better, I'm currently in a tiny house, which is 17 foot yeah. by eight foot. Whoa. <laughs> so smaller than yours. <laughs> But Mine's eight foot by twelve foot. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. That's okay. But it's, do you know? I think what we found from coming from quite a large house down to the tiny house is, it 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 sort of strips everything away from you in a good way, and you realise what's important, and you you are connected in such a stronger way when you do that, and the material things just don't mean anything. And you have a, a more genuine life, I feel. And it's not until you do it that you realise. And we're actually shortly going off grid. So we're not at the moment, but we will be. So <laughs> we're very close to what you, you're doing, sort of these solar and wind power. But, um, yeah, so it, it does, for us, it really made a difference to our spiritual lives. Um, and you, you just see life in a whole different way. And it's not important. As long as you've got a roof over your head and you've got food, that's all that matters. And love. Totally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you, so you mentioned a really important point too, because people don't know what they're capable of or where they're really at until they experience this. So a lot of people challenge my philosophies and and ideas around how I treat animals. But until you've treated animals this way, you cannot understand what it's costing you and them to treat them the other way. And that's the same as this lifestyle and what we choose yeah. to eat, and what we choose to think. I mean, we really don't know what's available until we've been on both sides of the fence. Absolutely, I totally agree with you. So how do you, do you ever, like you look back on your life, I was also, which is why I say I was so excited to interview, interview you tonight because I used to work in the horse industry as well in show jumping and polo. And how do you feel about your background? Because what were you working, like producing, what, in what sort of um, area of the equine industry? What were you produ producing? My real talent was in starting horses under, sta under saddle for all disciplines. But I was also a rehab specialist. So basically, okay. if there was a behavior issue, I could fix it. And yeah. But yeah. unfortunately, as I evolved in my training background, it became more about relationship and subtle manipulation of energy rather than technique and conditioning. So it, it became less and less transferable, which is why I moved into hoof care because that was an easy way to supplement the income I had lost from training. Yeah. So my question is looking back on what you used to do and how you used to work and what you used to produce, do you ever feel guilt and almost like, why why didn't it why didn't I connect earlier in the early days? You know, why did it take so long for me to go through all that and, and produce so many horses for that industry as we all did? What um how do you deal with it if there is any guilt? You might not hold any guilt, but how do you deal with that? And if anybody else is going through that same thing, what's your advice to overcome the guilt of what you've done previously? 
you know, even though you've turned everything around now? Well, I would say everyone goes through that because if you if you don't, then you wouldn't have been doing those things in the first place. <laughs> because if you're so yeah. connected that you can just skip over shame, <laughs> then you then you, that's not the kind of connection that um, exploits in the first place. So I don't carry guilt around what I did to horses any longer. Um, well, I guess that's not entirely true. I mean, when I'm spending time with different individuals in my herd certain things will come up. Um, like I'll feel remorseful that we couldn't have had this relationship sooner or that part of what I'm healing is, is the abuse that I caused. Uh, when I can see and, and when I'm brought face to face with what I've done to them, yeah, it definitely gets triggered again. But for the most part, I've truly healed that aspect of it. There were, it was at least a year where every time I got near one of my horses, just in a present state, I would just sob and emotion would just run through me. And it wasn't necessarily just the guilt or shame. It was just the welling up of trauma that had never been processed. Yeah. And so what my work about today is a lot of trauma recovery and truly embodied processes around grief. And I still carry a lot of grief and shame and regret, but not necessarily towards conditioned behavior that I played out that really wasn't my fault. Where, unfortunately, the more you move away from domestication, the more you open yourself up to some of the core wounds that create, you know, the stuff that makes us act out that way in the first place. So I'm learning. I'm getting deep into it these days. It's far beyond animals for me at this stage. And, you know, as guilt and shame come up, I really just try to be in my body and allow those emotions to move through me without the story that keeps them trapped. Brilliant. Yeah. And you quote in your book, um, you will never achieve the desired goal of your heart if your method for getting here is out of alignment with love. What do you mean by that? I mean that humanity has this almost sick perversion of thinking power is achieved externally. Mm. And so we think that what we desire is going to be found out here somewhere. When the truth is, is that when we understand who and what we really are, which is love, and love is so not what people think of that term, that term has been ruined, much less like terms like God and other words that are just thrown around as if people really understand the fullness of what they are. But mm -hmm. real love is so much bigger than any feeling of affection towards someone or it's a, it's a true way of being present in the world and being fully in acceptance with what is happening and, and who someone else is without trying to exert control over them or over your surroundings or over your circumstances. What we don't realize a lot of times is a lot of, I mean, our circumstances can change as a result of who we are and how we are behaving on the inside. And so when we pursue externally the things that we think we want, most of the time we're not even questioning what our motivation is or why we are pursuing that because usually there's a fundamental need that can be met internally that has nothing to do with the external pursuit or whatever we're after yeah absolutely so people say they love their animals and they do because i did as well before i was vegan it didn't make any difference i still love them um what does love actually mean to you you know for people who absolutely 100% say they love their animals and they do love them. How do you explain that? Because it's such a different way of being with, with animals. Yeah. It's really tough because I think if we chose different words, it would be people care about their animals and they really, really, really care about the need within them that is met through the animal. But to love an animal means to care for and, and accept them unconditionally because these are captive dependents. Not only are they captive dependents, they're permanent captive dependents, which means the power dynamic between them and their primary caregivers is so easily abused that mm -hmm. Pretty much everything we do with animals is an abuse of power by the very nature of what domestication is and what it means. So you can love an animal, 
But when we domesticate them, which means condition them in any way for our use, which means any form of training, which means positive reinforcement, which means any sort of manipulation, whether that involves treats or any of that, that's not love. That is, I need you to behave different so that I can feel a certain way. That is emotional dependency, also known as codependency, and codependency between a guardian and a dependent is abuse. Mm. And what would you say to those that maybe say, but it's in their interest because obviously to keep them safe, because that's what people will say. Oh, totally. And you can keep a being safe uh, without using them. And so, you know, as their caregivers, we have a direct fundamental responsibility to meet their needs and make sure they're well cared for and seen and safe. But that doesn't necessarily mean we have to manipulate or change who they are. What we have to do is up our relationship game and learn how to be responsible and accountable. Most people would rather skip over that part because that doesn't feel good. That's uncomfortable. We would rather exert control, even in the nicest way, over those in our care, because if we don't, we have to face where we're not measuring up as leaders that would create the cooperation in the first place. Yeah, I've got Kira Wise, she's watching at the moment, and she says, um, because I'm gonna come back to you, Kira, for one second, because there's been a massive, in the last five, 10 years, there's been a massive, massive movement of natural horsemanship, which is a great step away from the traditional but what do you feel about natural horsemanship and people like Monty Roberts and because he was one of the first, I guess, and Pirelli, et cetera. How do you feel about that way of training? Obviously, I know what you just said, because that sort of answers <laughs> the word training. <laughs> just jumped myself into that, didn't I? But you know what I mean? Like Kira said, how do you feel about these alternative trainers? Well, I actually disagree that it is a, a better form of training. It is a more dishonest form of training and it is a more insidiously harmful form of training. And the difference between that kind of training and the more traditional brute force kind is that it enlisted millions of women around the world for the first time to start taking on toxic masculinity and applying it in a dominating way over the animals they claimed to love. Um, and I can get into that a lot further, but um, natural horsemanship is psychological warfare. It's not, it's not love and it's not kind. It actually changes who they are more than just direct force, which does not manipulate their emotional environment. And the thing with natural horsemanship versus the old style, which was really just about physically using the horse, is that it it incorporates codependency, which is far more harmful on the grander scale of things, not just for the horses, but for the people that engage with it because they never become emotionally mature while being dependent upon a dependent. Um, there's just a lot of consequences that people are unaware of to that kind of relationship and the ooey gooey feelings that it, creates that are actually based on serious manipulation and betrayal. Okay, so uh, Jennifer's put a good interesting question here. She said that they want to please us. So what are your thoughts about that when people say that they want to please us? I mean, my dog. Well, that, that, that's please true. Us. That's why it's such an abhorrent abuse of power to get your needs met through somebody who depends on you for their basic needs, their survival needs. And so when your children want to please you, do you take advantage of that? The answer should be no. These are not equals. They are captive dependents. And I think this power dynamic is where people really, really, really get confused. These are big, powerful, amazing animals that we want to see in a more equal light. But the truth is, is they can't be because psychologically and emotionally, they are at our whim. And we have to handle that with very delicate awareness of just how much influence we have over them. And of course they want to please us. They are like our kids, they depend on us. So how we feel about them affects their well-being in a huge way. And I think that is the most painful part of moving in a different direction is coming to terms with the fact that 
maybe we're not actually loving these animals that we care so deeply about because the care and the concern is really, really there. The problem is, is that we're living in a paradigm of codependency that is masquerading as love. And that is not good for any of us. Mm. And how do you find people, how are people like receptive to your ideas and the way you are around animals? I know you do animal communication and obviously the way you now exist with animals. What's the reception like from, you know, the horse industry in particular? I mean, how, how do you find <laughs> most people? <laughs> I definitely don't talk to horse people. <laughs> That's, they're not the ones seeking this. <laughs> um, so... It depends on what the people are actually looking for. If they are looking yeah. for self-healing and uh, becoming whole and trauma recovery and, you know, if they're on a spiritual path and if they are really into self-reflection and, and that kind of thing, they're extremely receptive to this work. If they are deeply attached to their relationship with animals and what needs they are getting met through that relationship, they, they're not usually open to this. And I totally understand why, because it is a brutal, brutal transition. Um, and if you don't have support or knowledge or tools, I don't know why anyone would, would, would go through this. But what's on the other side is so incredibly powerful that you would never want to go back. You would never want to go back. I think for me, one of the things I get, I've got two horses, a Frisian and a Shire Cross. And um, they are, you know, they're just, they don't, I don't ride. They're just big, expensive <laughs> friends, <laughs> so to speak. And over the years, I've had so many people say, but why do you not ride them? I, obviously, I used to. But um, they say, why don't you ride them? You know, what a waste. And I never see it as a waste. I see it as an actual benefit to my life because they're so amazing when you just stop everything, go back to nothing and just be friends. And I don't expect anything from them. And the difference in the way they are with me is like, it, it, you can't even, I can't even describe the feeling I get when I'm around them and when I hope <laughs> they enjoy my company as well. But it, it is a very, very different feeling um, being with a horse and just being than actually them having to do anything or being expected to do anything. Because they, my two know now, I don't expect anything from them apart from just as long as they're safe and they're happy and they're healthy. And something enormously powerful happens when mm. once the animal realizes that is true within you, because that's when they begin, begin to heal from their own conditioning and their own domestication. And the thing is, is people that challenge this will never understand what's on the other side of this until they have stopped using their animal long enough to see how different their animal becomes on the other side of it. I have 18 equines in my care. I've had them this whole time because I brought all of them with me from Texas when I stopped. Who they have become in the last six years is completely different than who they were before and who they were before were incredibly willing to please. They were very cooperative. I was a really good trainer. I could do anything I wanted with these horses or on their backs or whatever, but who they are now is so incredibly expressive. They're so alive and so present and so able to communicate with me, not just in an energetic sense, but really obviously communicate, like show me what they need and what they want. And the boundaries that exist between us are very clear and very uh, appropriate and very healthy. And so there is just something enormously <sighs> filled with well-being, being around them that is so different than when I was using them to get my needs met and, and completely unaware of it at the time. Yeah. Which I think every, you know, the horse people, including myself back then, you, it's what's done. It's what you are yeah. brought up to believe. It's what your trainers have told you to do. What you're, you know, when you go to, when you're little and you go to the riding school, this is how you dismount. This is how you get, get on the horse. This is what you do. You hold the reins here. And it's almost like it, you are brainwashed into this is how totally. you do things. And there's no other way. And then yeah. you find, what we call the alternative natural horsemanship and then you think you're doing better doing that 
And then when you find this way of life with the animals, and it started for me after being vegan, um, like you say, you, it, it, it's it's profound. The difference in the horses is just, I, I, I can't wait to show people, you know, when we move, you know, friends who come over, the difference in the horses when they're in their natural, as natural as we can get them, natural state. Because yeah. when they're at home, they're so different to when they're on a yard. And currently mine have to be on the yard because we haven't got any land at the moment. So oh. it's it's incredible to see the difference and the, the joy you get from that connection goes beyond anything else. And like you say, you would never, ever go back when you experience that joy in that connection with the horses being horses and being themselves. And that personality of those horses come through so, so bright. And it's pure love, unconditional love. And that's yeah. what we're all craving at the end of the day, whether it's human or animal, it's, it's unconditional love. Right. So when did you go vegan? Because I know you're vegan. Why and when? The relationship to the horses changed first. That's what actually caused me to go vegan. And so what's interesting about this is I went vegan as a result of ending exploitation in my life, not changing my diet. And so when I wrote my first book, it threw me into all these vegan circles. And all of a sudden I was this vegan spokesperson and I'm hanging out with all these vegans that yeah, they're eating plants, but they're still exploiting the hell out of the animals in their care. And nobody like, it, it was really interesting. I got way more, let's put it this way. <laughs> Plant eating vegans that still emotionally exploit their pets are way more angry than horseback riders <laughs> when I talk about not riding. <laughs> so that was, that was really challenging and difficult for me because this is not about right and wrong at all. It's like, I don't care what somebody else does, but I am going to speak up about what I believe in and, and what I've achieved to learn these things. If someone wants to keep eating meat or keep riding their horse, I'm the last person on the planet that's going to show up and be like, hey, you need to quit doing that. I've done it all. There is nothing that someone else has done or is doing to animals that I have not done. And so... This is really about trying to get people to understand that something much better than what they're getting is on the other side of all this if they're willing to become healthy, emotionally mature adult human beings. Most people don't want that. They want to stay feeling comfortable and safe and in this codependent state that does not make them challenge um, trauma. Mm. And do you think this sort of goes into relationships with humans as well, not just the animals? Does it extend out to the human to human relationship? It does. And it does in ways that are far more difficult and far more challenging than changing it with animals, because that's that's where I'm really exploring this now and where it's ultimately moving towards. Yeah, because you know. Sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. That's okay. I was going to say, because your book is amazing. I mean, I'll hold it up again. because mm -hmm. If you haven't already got it, it's a really, ooh, hold on. How do we get it on there? It's a really, really interesting read. You can get it on Amazon. Um, I really do sort of um, endorse it. It's fantastic. Um, now, with obviously, that's your first book, and you've got the second book coming up. Can you explain a bit more then about that second book? Yeah, so the first book is just my story and alludes to kind of what this is. The next book is pretty intense. It is the why and the how. So it is the philosophy behind all of this and where it really comes from, this fundamental root of separation from, from each other and all life on the planet, how that occurs, how it is perpetuated, and then the actual body of work I've created as a result of living like this that teaches people the practical steps of how do you undomesticate your relationships with these animals so that you can find your own internal freedom. And it it's more focused on dogs because I wanted to reach a larger audience. And that's what's great about this work is it, it is universal. It does not matter if you're applying this to a horse or a tree or another human. It's going to have various different challenges, but it is the same work because it is simply unconditional love. And we're just so far removed from what that looks like um, in a practical reality. So that's what the new book is. And this work really doesn't have anything to do with animals. But if you have animals, 
it's fundamentally important to be practicing with them before you can ever expect love to pass that and into your relationship with yourself and other humans because because of the nature of their dependency on us we have more control over their lives than pretty much anything else in our lives until we learn how to control ourselves and by practicing unconditional love with them you learn how to take control of your own inner dialogue and your inner emotional responses and you know the the most important thing I've gotten out of all this work is learning how to respond instead of react. I'm no longer at the mercy of feelings that get triggered in me by other people. Yeah, absolutely. We've got Zaza here. Say hi, Zaza, one of the followers. Uh, she's amazing. And she says there's a beautiful high frequency vibes going on here. And I feel it too. <laughs> As I said, all my fingers are buzzing and they normally do that when I'm very excited. Um, well, so when you ask about the challenges of this work, for me, that was the biggest one. I was so disconnected. I mean, I grew up in Texas. I hope you guys kind of understand what that means. And I, suddenly I was hearing animals talk and I could feel everything. And that was, that was traumatic for me, especially coming <laughs> out of a traumatic childhood and had all these tools that were unconscious to keep from feeling everything. Suddenly I can feel everything. So be prepared for that if you, if you move in this direction. <laughs> Every animal communicator will tell you it's a journey <laughs> and it's never easy. It really isn't easy. If you're going down that route, it's fantastic. It's one of the best things ever. However, it's like that yin and yang. It's, um, yeah. you know, but it builds who you are. It builds your spiritual growth and you learn from the experience. But it is absolutely amazing. And one of the challenges, I guess, animal communicators have, such as yourself and myself and uh, Zaza as well, she's here. Um, is you know learning to accept who you are and what you're feeling and being able to put that out there with grace and understanding that maybe others aren't quite there yet and I don't mean yeah. that condescending I just mean we're all at different sort of times in our journey in this life and you know I question myself why wasn't I vegan when I was a child why wasn't I vegan when I was a teenager <laughs> What happened? So it, it, you know, I, 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 it's it, it's a real big issue for me, and I just think, oh, I could scream at myself. What made it? You know, overnight, and you just think, why wasn't I vegan before? So it's it's one of those issues that I think it being an animal communicator really opens up your whole world to you know spiritual growth. I guess, yeah. I guess that's what it is. Um, so how can people follow your work? Do you have a website? I know you've got your book. Um, can you share where people can follow your work? Yeah, the best way to follow me right now is through Patreon. And so I'm actually actively teaching my work on Patreon and there's various tiers, but because the the real challenge for for me in a practical sense is i left everything behind i mean i was a professional horsewoman so i've got 18 horses how am i supposed to take care of them i have no idea how we've gotten through the past six years most of it has been the help and support of people who really want to see this work get brought to the world but yeah. um one the i love living this simply but the main reason we live this simply is because i don't have a choice so Patreon is how I get my income right now while I'm finishing the new book. So every yeah. dollar that goes into that really directly supports and feeds the horses and meets the most basic needs around here. And once the new book comes out, uh, I will launch my website and start offering coaching and various opportunities to learn this. But right now the community we've got building on Patreon is just incredible. It's mostly vegan, but you don't have to be vegan because I wasn't vegan when I started this. This work will probably make you vegan, so be prepared for that. But, yeah. you know, we just have an open dialogue. I'm learning this like everyone else. The principles of my work were God-given. I mean, they're, they're flawless, but I'm very human. I, I have a lot of rough edges. I have an interesting background that has allowed me not only to know the things I know, but I still have plenty of work to do on myself. And so everyone is really received in a in a very open way there's this is not about judging or making people wrong i'm but i'm gonna call things what they are <laughs> and i think everyone needs to get a little bit more comfortable with that 
Absolutely. And I think that's great. And I know that if people go on YouTube, you've got some videos on YouTube, they can actually see you in action, see the work that you do, see your horses and the other animals. Well, and on it's that note, <laughs> those are not my videos. But I didn't put those out there and they are oh. pretty outdated. Um, but yeah, you can you can kind of touch on it. Things have evolved a great, great deal since any of those videos were put on. And I am going to be making new videos, but yeah, they're out there. But that was a real uh, transitory period of of this whole journey. And um, things are a little bit different now. This It's a lot more subtle and there's a lot more awareness to what this is. Uh, and those will be coming. But yeah, you can get a taste for it via YouTube. And I also have a Facebook. And so I post regularly on Facebook and on Instagram. But I'm going to take a break from that for the next few weeks to finish this book. Yeah, and I, I think that for people who maybe, you know, have never heard of working with horses this way, and I, maybe that's the wrong word, working with them, but being with them, um, it's a good start. The videos um, are a good start to understand who you are. And, yes, you evolve because we all evolve with our work. Um, but it is a good start, I feel. I mean, I have watched them and, I, you know, that's where I first saw you. And I thought, actually, this is this is fascinating. And um, over the years, I mean, from us speaking today, give it five years and you'll be in a completely different place again. <laughs> so yeah. we'll have to think back in five years time. But, you know, life evolves, your work will evolve. And, you know, it, it's fantastic what you do. And I wish you all the luck in the world. And I think what you do is amazing. Mm -hmm. And it touches on my heart because very similar. Um, and it's very, very difficult to explain to people how magical it is when you get to that point on the other side. It's just in, almost impossible, I, I guess. And I, I'm in awe of you that you're able to write it down because <laughs> it's very, very difficult. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And um, it's just been an absolute pleasure. Um, I'm Likewise. so honored to have you here, honestly. And um, I wish you all the best. And we'll talk again. So thank you so much, Ren. Lots of love. Thank you, uh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> so that was Ren Hurst. Absolutely amazing very different if you've never experienced anybody like that before I do do honestly ask you to go and check her out her work is amazing what she does is amazing and it really is magical so please please go and check Ren Hurst out and again if you haven't got the book even if you're sort of sitting on the fence saying no it's not for me just get the book just give it a read I think it'll surprise you I think it, honestly it will surprise you it's available on amazon you can get it on there and um thank you so much for watching my name's joanne hull www.joannehull.com take care and i'll speak very soon